So you can also find the talk on GitHub. I'm Kathy Reid on Twitter. Uh, and I will be asking for joining feedback as well after my presentation. So level zero open source developer. What are we going to uh, cover in our session today? We're going to pick up tips for planning your open source career. So if you're looking to level up, uh, if you're looking to understand what sort of skill sets it takes to succeed in open source, we'll be looking at alignment with personal motivations and personal values so that as you plan your career, you make sure that you're taking the step in the right direction that aligns with your personal motivations, your personal superpowers, that sort of thing. We'll learn what some of those superpowers are, but moreover, we'll also learn the interpersonal and conceptual thinking that's also required to succeed in open source. We'll start to build skill trees to follow, and I'll talk you through how to build your own personal skill tree to build your open source career. We'll talk a little bit about social capital, but that's all right, it won't be a political rant. Um, I'll talk you through things like mentorship and sponsorship and how you can really start to plan out your own career. So the very first thing I'd like to ask, how many of you knew that you wanted to be an open source, an open source developer, an open source hardware person right from high school? Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> and how many of you chose the right subjects at university, got into the right organisation, did the right internships, planned everything out? Okay, again, doesn't surprise me, a little bit there. How many of you sort of fell into the role that you're doing at the moment? Yeah, quite a few. That's really interesting. So how many of you have played a role-playing game before, like World of Warcraft or something like that? Yeah, pretty much everyone. Minecraft, Dungeons and Dragons. Cool. So in Dungeons and Dragons or Minecraft, the thing that you have to do with your character first is figure out what their strengths and weaknesses are. And in RPG, what you do, you roll some dice, you get a character sheet. That's all pretty much done for you. Here we actually need to figure out what our strengths and weaknesses are so that we know how we have to level up. So the, the thing that we have to work on is um, understanding our character. And does anybody remember the very first time that you played Minecraft and you totally forgot to chop down wood and you forgot to build a shelter and then nightfall came and the monsters came and ate you? Yep, real life's kind of like that. So what we need to do is figure out what our game plan is. So we need a game plan for our career. So how do we figure out a game plan for our career? How do we figure out a strategy, a game strategy? Well, first of all, we have to know ourselves. We have to figure out what our strengths and weaknesses are so that we can work with them and learn to respond to our environment with strengths and weaknesses. Now, Matrix fans might recognise um, that Greek lettering that's from the Oracle, uh, the Oracle in Delphi urging us to know ourselves. So if you're here today at Open Source Developer Conference, you're probably pretty intelligent. You probably like uh, pulling things apart, putting them back together, optimising them, making them better. That's probably the sort of person you are. But we need, to we need to dig a little bit deeper. So different people are motivated by different things. Some people are motivated by money. Some people want to buy that chrome-coloured car to drive around Abu Dhabi. <laughs> Some people are motivated by curiosity. Some people are motivated by altruism. They want to do good things. There's six billion, six and a half billion people on the planet, and there's six and a half billion different motivations. But they can usually be distinguished or um, segregated into two different types of motivations. So external motivation. External motivation is all around uh, rewards or people giving you things in order to do things where you might not ordinarily put in the effort or um, go the extra mile to do them. So performance bonuses, employee of the month awards, that sort of thing. So to demonstrate external, external motivators, I'm going to pick on Peter here. Sorry, Peter, I should have warned you about this in advance. There's Minty's involved. So... Peter, if I give you a handful of minties, will you put your hand up for me? Yep, fabulous. That's external motivation. Here are your minties. Here's your external motivator. In intrinsic motivators are, are very different. They're much more complex, but they're also much more powerful. And there's a whole heap of in, uh, intrinsic motivators. There's things like pride in workmanship. There's things like 
um, social acceptance, things like social status. Has anyone ever seen Linus Torvalds being fangirled at a Linux conf? That's social status. You know, that might be, I, I can't speak for Linus, I'm not Linus, I'm, I, you know, that might be one of the things that motivates him to do what he does. If anyone sees Donald Trump or Lindsay Fox, they're motivated by money. They're motivated by the reward that they get. It's a very different motivator. So think about someone at work uh, that you've worked with who shows incredible pride in workmanship. They might be working on something that you see as small or trivial or insignificant, but the incredible pride of workmanship that they show. And you know that when you see their code or you see their documentation, you know Jane's written that code. It's spot on. And I'm reminded of what Ben said in his talk yesterday. I can't have my code looking like that. I've got a reputation to uphold. Pride in workmanship is an incredibly powerful internal motivator. Imagine, uh, has anyone here worked in a team where it was an absolute pleasure to go to work because the, the team you were working with was incredibly fun? Yep. How was, how was it going to work? You really wanted to go to work? Would you have taken a pay cut to go to work? <laughs> so it was a very different motivator. You, you were motivated by the team, by the culture, by the people around you. It was an incredibly strong intrinsic motivator. What motivates the OSDC team to spend countless hours of their own time putting together this, this conference? It's pride in workmanship. It's, it's commitment to a cause. Richard, all the work you do with GovHack, we've got a lot of um, intrinsically motivated people in the open source community. And it's incredibly important that we think about internal and intrinsic motivations when we're building open source projects and open source communities. Imagine that you're coming into an open source community for the very first time. Might not be very welcoming. You might not have a lot of social status because you're the noob. You haven't risen the ranks, you haven't integrated or uh, done a lot of engagement with that community. The community might not make you feel very welcome. They, they may, for instance, completely flame your commits on, let me pick a completely random example that I hadn't prepared before, the Linux kernel mailing list. Think about in open source projects and open source communities, how you're meeting the intrinsic motivations of some of the people that you're trying to attract. Otherwise, you may not keep them if you don't understand their internal motivations. So social acceptance and the need to um, feel welcomed are very, very powerful motivators. Curiosity is also an incredibly powerful motivator. And again, I'll pick a completely random example that has no political significance whatsoever. Everyone's probably seen the storm that um, uh, came to being when Ahmed brought a clock to school and the teachers thought it was a bomb and they, you know, had the incredibly reasonable approach of arresting him, taking him down to the police station, etc. People are motivated by curiosity, particularly in this community. And if we want people to succeed, A, we have to trigger your curiosity, but we also need to maintain your curio curiosity. And if you're looking to open source your career, uh, level up your open source career, think about how curious you still are. Are you still motivated by curiosity? how things work, that sort of thing. And to wrap up that discussion, what I'd like to do is a little bit of experiment. This might fall flat on my face, but to save me the fear of embarrassment, I'm sure you won't let that happen, will you? See, look, intrinsic motivation. Now, with no minties involved, can I get you all to raise your hands? Oh, look at that. That is intrinsic motivation. No minties exchanged hands. You did it because you wanted to please me. <laughs> I will, I'll use my powers with, uh, with very good grace. So a related topic is something called flow state. Now, there's been a lot of empirical research done on this and all of my academic references are at the, the end of the slide deck if you're interested in this topic. Flow state in open source is something that uh, has turned up in the research as a strong motivator. One of the things that gets people interested in contributing and committing to open source is that as they're working on something in open source, they enter a flow state. 
Now, the best way to describe flow state is to, is to talk you through the process. I'm assuming everyone here knows how to drive or has learnt to drive at some point. Yep, pretty much. And do you remember the first time that you got into the car? And the gears everywhere and clutch and accelerator. Oh, my God, I've got to check the mirrors. Oh, my God. But you understand, it was completely overwhelming. You had so many things going on at once, you, you felt completely out of your depth. Um, at that time, you were incompetent with that task. And then you slowly learned to drive and it all came together and it all integrated and now you want to drive the chromium Maserati down the highway in Abu Dhabi. You've reached a flow state. So you're quite comfortable driving. And now you probably feel, let's say you're on the, the Lonnie Hobart Highway, it's pretty boring drive. There's not a lot going on there. You're probably going to get a little bit bored because you know how to drive. You're checking the mirrors. You've got your brakes happening. You know, you've got very good road, road handling conditions. You're going to get bored with that. And flow state is exactly the same thing. Remember the first time that you used a shell, a born shell, seashell, that sort of thing? And it, it didn't feel really... You weren't comfortable. You weren't at home with using the shell. And now you can sit and walk and grip like a boss. And using the shell has become second nature. And if you had to do it all the time, you'd get really bored with it unless you were you know, really pushing yourself. Flow state is, is, is exactly that. When you have high task challenge and high competency, that's when you're going to reach flow state. So as you realise that there are new skills that you have to learn, they're going to be uncomfortable at first. So how many, how many people here are, are not quite comfortable public speaking or wouldn't relish the opportunity to speak in public? There's a few of us. So if you made the decision that you wanted to do public speaking and that was one way that you wanted to level up your career, when you first started doing that, you're going to feel incredibly anxious because it's something that you don't yet have the competency for. And this is a, I guess this is a road sign. As you're levelling up your career, you're going to be a little bit out of your comfort zone, but stick with it. Eventually, if you persist hard enough, you're going to get into that flow state and you're going to master that skill. So the flow state is at the end of the, is at the, end of the tunnel. So flow state is something really, really useful to keep in mind, not only if you're learning something new, but also if you're managing a team and you can see where your team is. So if somebody really struggling with this and they need a bit of a hand, somebody bored with what they're doing, really useful tool. So there's quite a lot of work on flow state and uh, open source in the literature. Another closely related topic um, that I want to talk on around um, motivation and around flow is something called growth mindset. And this is something that a lady called Carol Dweck has done a lot of research on. Does anybody have in their team the sort of person who says, I'm just no good at X, I'm just no good at JavaScript, or I just don't get Ansible, or oh my God, <laughs> Zookeeper. <laughs> Sorry, <it's laughs> I'm not picking on Zookeeper, I swear. I have to use it here again, I'll kill someone. Um, <laughs> big different. So, or you've had the person who says, I'm just no good at maths, even statistics, it's just too overwhelming. I don't even want to start it. That's what we call a fixed mindset. It doesn't, it doesn't recognise that people's cognitive capabilities are fluid, they're dynamic. When we all started our careers, we were, you know, headstrong 17-year-olds who had, you know, 20, 30 years of learning ahead of them. We just didn't realise it. Having a growth mindset puts you in the right space to think about your career and to level up your career. So people who have a growth mindset respond better to criticism. So you look at the people, the speakers, who are actively seeking criticism and feedback on their talks through joined in at this conference. They have a growth mindset. They want to use that feedback to improve their performance and to improve their skill set. Growth mindset people are going to say, look, I know I'm not very good at C, but if it's something that I really need to learn to get to the next level in my career, then I'm going to tackle it. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to put the effort in. I'm going to really try. People who have a growth mindset put the effort in they put the um, concentration in little bit by little bit and then they go through flow state, they'll get anxious about it and then their task improves and suddenly 
they're coding C or they're doing maths or they're public speaking. So it's about recognising, do you have a fixed mindset? Do you have a growth mindset? Is that something that you need to think about before you level up your career? So once you've recognised um, what motivates you, once you've recognised whether you have a fixed or a growth mindset and you know what, you, what it is that you want to learn, we then need to figure out... You know, sorry, I forgot to level you up. You now have a growth mindset. Level up XP, you win. Um, the characters there are from Habit RPG, by the way, which is all open source. One of the best things I've come across in this space is something called learning styles. So who here loves podcasts? Yeah, a lot of podcast people. You probably learn orally, so you, you probably enjoy me talking at you and you're probably more focused on what I'm saying than on what the slides are. Who here likes images and diagrams and YouTube? Yeah, fantastic. You're probably visual thinkers. Um, I might be able to give you a diagram or a book in a foreign language, but because it's got diagrams on it, you'll, you'll understand the concept that's being, being conveyed. How many people prefer written textbooks or written manuals or learn through reading? Yep, a few of us. And how many people learn by doing? Yep, quite a lot. Um, we often find that people who um, are trampolinists or gymnasts or rock climbers, they, they tend to learn through doing, through movement. Um, what you'll find, the, these are called VARC styles, so visual, oral, reading, writing and kinesthetic. If you're looking to open source your career or level up or learn a new skill, understanding what your VARC preference is is really, really useful. I found this incredi incredibly useful um, when I started a new role about three years ago. I'm, I'm quite a natural introvert, but my one up and two up managers are extreme extroverts, and their preferred method of communication is sound, 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 talk, 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 sound, sound, sound. When I did my VARC test, I scored minus 10 on oral. I hate podcasts, and I turned the sound on YouTube down and used subtitles. I can't stand being speaking, so apologies, speakers, but I, I promise I was looking at the slides. I learned through slides. I learned through diagrams and symbols and charts and that sort of thing, and through reading, which is quite unusual. So that helped me understand the best way that I could learn from these people and the best way that I could level up from them. So understand your VARC style and you'll understand how you best learn. Or it might show you, you know, this is why you hate podcasts or this is why you can't stay on YouTube. So one of the things I'd like to have a chat about in terms of open levelling up your open source career, we talked a little bit before about RPGs and I think we've got quite a good room of gamers. Can anyone tell me what the skill tree, which game that skill tree is from? I've got no idea. It's actually a real question. I've got no idea. <laughs> no? Okay. What we can see in the skill tree is that this is a pretty classic skill tree. Your character can develop in, say, one of four directions. And in order to progress, in order to level up, you have to master a sequence of skills or a cluster of skills. The same is absolutely true in real life. So what you need to be able to do is understand what your skill tree is as an open source person. And when you think about characters in um, role-playing games, you know, paladins and mages and wizards, the same applies to open source as well. So I don't really want to admit this in public, but I will. I've wasted far too much of my time on a game called The Secret World. It's awesome. I could talk about it for hours, but I won't because then you won't hear the rest of my talk. Anyway, in The Secret World, you get to choose a character class. So you can be an Illuminati, you can be a Templar, you, know, you can be a, a Kung Fu fighter. And then what you have to do is choose two complementary skill sets. So you can choose elemental magic matched with blades, or my favourite, which is blood magic matched with pistols. <laughs> okay, no, I won't, I won't go on any further. But what this does is make you think about complementary skill sets. And I'll get to that a little bit later as well when I talk about um, three overlapping circles of skills. So the key takeaway here is that you need to think about what your character class is and what the skill sets are in your character class. 
So when we talk about skill sets in general, when we talk about somebody's professional portfolio, we talk about three overlapping groups of skills. So if you're going to build your open source character class, these are the three key skills, skill branches that you need. You need technical skills. Not every role in open source requires strong technical skills. We have a huge number of contributors to the open source community who are non-technical. People who run communities, people who run events, people who do publicity and promotion and marketing for open source groups aren't necessarily technical practitioners. However, if you're doing Ansible or C or web development or front-end development or numerous other pieces of technical work, you're going to need pretty strong technical skills. Conceptual skills. Casey talked about things like agile and continuous development and pushing to production every day, continuous integration. They're conceptual skills. So things like quality assurance and test-driven development, behaviour-driven development, experience-driven development, user experience, those are conceptual pieces. And you need to have a good grasp of those as well. Has anyone seen or worked with a cowboy or a, I don't mean to be gender specific, somebody who was a rogue, who would push to production without ever testing anything? Yep, good technical skills, poor conceptual skills probably pour into personal skills as well because, you know, mucked everything up for the team. And then we get to interpersonal skills. And for people who have spent a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of educational effort in becoming technical specialists, interpersonal skills are one of the hardest things for us to master as open source specialists. But as you become more senior, as you go into middle team leader, middle management, senior management, executive roles, it's your conceptual and your interpersonal skills that will actually carry more weight than your technical skills. So keep that in mind for career development. So what are some of the technical, conceptual and interpersonal skills? Hopefully I won't bore you to death with this. Let me know if you're asleep. So technical skills cover things like platform, sorry. Exactly. <laughs> So technical skills look at things like platform and product specialisations. Are you a C guru? Are you a PHP guru? Are you like Katie yesterday who knew all the ins and outs of different languages in you know, all sorts of different things? Um, hardware specialisations. I know we've got quite a few open hardware people here who do a lot of Arduino and a lot of board development. Some of the conceptual skills that you might come across are things like uh, project management, life cycle management, product management. I know Casey mentioned um, tactical business owners in the business who want a product but have no concept of product management. Product management is a conceptual skill. And then interpersonal skills. Has anyone met, you know, a leader or a manager who you absolutely admire and respect? You can't quite put your finger on it but there is something about the way they carry themselves, the way they interact with you, that ingrains respect, the commandeer's authority. They may not be the smartest person in the room, but they carry influence and the ability to drive outcomes um, beyond what their resume might say. That's an interpersonal skill. The person who can calm down a client just with the tone of their voice the person you give all of your really hot clients to, there's one in every team, they've got strong interpersonal skills. The person who can go from nothing to 100 miles an hour and suddenly in 24 hours you've turned something out the door because they've driven it, they've managed it, they've broken it down on project management. That's an interpersonal skill as well. There's a lot of different skill sets in these three columns, much more than I could cover today, but the key takeaway for you is to think about what are your skill sets in technical, conceptual and interpersonal and what might you need to work on to level up. So I talked a little bit before about applying classes from RPG to real life. Now, I thought this would be really easy. I'll go onto Google, I'll type in skill set classes for open source and I won't have to spend a lot of time on my presentation. Shortcut, yeah, wasn't to be. Silly, Kathy. 
So one of the things that we don't seem to have as an open source community are templates or pro formas or some sort of structure to give to people who are new in their open source careers or looking at level up, leveling up to provide a skill tree. And what I'd really like to start today is some sort of artifact, some sort of generic class with skill levels that people in the open source community as professionals, as team leaders, as managers, can use to help do professional and career development for them and their staff. And, and this is, no pun intended, this is the kernel of an idea. This is the, the beginning of something. So when we think about what a skill tree is for a kernel hacker, in the technical stream, they have to have knowledge of deep internals. They need to know concurrent programming techniques because <laughs> we don't run single-threaded systems anymore. They need to know strong programming skills in low-level languages. You know, they need to know a bit of C. And they need deep knowledge of things like storage and file systems and paging and da 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 da, -da. I, I'm not a kernel hacker, so if I've got any, anything of this wrong, please let me know. Just not on the LKML, thanks. So conceptually, they need to be reverse engineers. They need to know how something happened and track back to find out what happened. They need to know things like root cause analysis and component failure impact analysis. So when they get a core dump, they, they can find out what went wrong. They need to know things like revision control. You know, they need to be able to submit a patch if they've written one. So they're conceptual skills that, that they need to have. Interpersonally, they need to be able to engage appropriately in the forums that are used for kernels. They need to be able to do things like handle the unique nature of the community. So how are they going to go engaging with something like the LKML? Front-end devs have a very different skill tree. So if I were to you know, write an RPG called you know, Open Source of Ages or you know, Open Source 3, Strike Back, this is, this is another class, front-end dev. Needs to have strong HTML. <laughs> Just for a joke, I was going to put Flash in there and then I thought I'd be lynched, so I haven't. Um, front-end devs need to know things like JavaScript and graphical tools. They need to know their way around HTTPD and Nginx and be able to you know, spin up a web server. Conceptually, they need to know user experience design, user research. They need to know things like um, card sorting. They also need strong pro uh, project management skills. Interpersonally, they need to listen and engage with users who are going to use the products that they produce. And they need user empathy for better design. Aha, now I see why clicking on this form is completely and awesomely horrible, and here's a patch. And you know, there's a different class for data scientists. I don't want to bore everyone by going through every piece of minutia. There's probably half a dozen more classes I can think of off the top of my head. You know, hardware hacker, community manager, all those sorts of classes in open source. And what I hope this is is the beginning of something like skills for the information age for the open source community. So I think I've got time. What I'd like to do is just walk you through. That's probably not showing up too well. I'll, I'll talk it through. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Oops, demo fail. <laughs> sorry, demo gods. Anyway, what Skills for the Information Age is, is it, it's a tool for you know, pointy-headed managers like me to figure out what my workforce looks like in the next five years. Where do I need more business architecture skills? Where do I need more business analysis skills? Where do I need more support skills, first level support skills? What do I outsource? What do I insource? What do I grow internally from within my team? We don't have this for open source. So what I'd like to do after today, and in the discussion if we have time, is look at what SFIA looks like for the open source community. So th this is the, the seed of the idea I have around all of this. And thank you for the time call. So one thing I'd like to talk about um, once we have our motivations, once we know what our skill set looks like, once we know what our learning style is, once we've established a professional reputation, we need to defend that reputation. 
So if I put a picture of somebody up in a conference and I ask, I'm going to give this lady a really hard job to do, is she going to get it done? Hell yes. This is Donna Benjamin. She ran Linux Conf 8. She's on the Drupal board. I know that if I get her to do something, it's going to be done. It's going to be done well. She carries professional reputation. She carries professional weight. Every interaction you have in every professional standing connotes the sort of person that you are, the sort of professional that you are. Do you have good interpersonal skills? Do you leave people with a feeling of this person knows what he or she is about? Do I trust this person? Does this person have gravitas? Is this the person I'm going to go to and hire them because I want them on my team? Every interaction you have connotes your professional reputation. So it's about, I did a head count before, it's about 22 people in the room at the moment. Do you all know each other? Have you all been introduced? Okay, no, I won't do that trick of where you have to stand up and introduce yourself because we're a little bit out of time. But think about that. Think about how you're um, projecting yourself, your personal brand. Don't worry, it's the only marketing word I'll use in my speech. Otherwise, I'll be lynched as well. So think about every interaction you have being an extension of your professionalism, who you are, and more importantly, who you aspire to be. I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about your professional posse. So when you play D and D, thank you. When you play D and D, when you did, um, you know, World of Warcraft, anyone done like a forty-person raid? Yeah, no. All right. You can't do that sort of raid unless you have forty people around you. You have to have a team behind you. And part of levelling up your open source career is about knowing the people that you want around you in your professional circle. This is a concept called social capital. And again, lots of academic references in the back of the slide deck. Social capital is the intangible value you have from your networks. It's the intangible value you have in your professional life through knowing a wide range of people, developing strong relationships with a wide range of people, because it gives you a currency. It enables me to do something like, excuse me, Paul, would you mind if I wore your hat for five minutes? Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Very Remember the time when we were at LCA 2012 and I wore this? Gosh, that was a great time. <laughs> social capital at work. Oh, don't worry, I'll give it back. So social capital is something that you need to grow to open up, to level up your open source career as well. Think about the professional party you want behind you because it's going to help you get that next job. It's going to help you get that next promotion. Most of the senior job market, so above middle manager, senior manager, executive, chief executive, that level of the market is almost entirely what we call a passive market. We don't advertise those jobs. We walk up to people at conferences and gatherings and summits and we say, look, We've got an opening coming up in about 12 months' time. Like, the, saw your resume online. Not sure what you're doing in about 12 and a half months' time. That's how it works. So think about how you're going to get a recruiter to come up to you and know about you, know about your profile, and have confidence in your ability to be able to do that job. Now, networking is something that some people in open source consider a dirty word. It isn't. You don't have to be inauthentic. You don't have to do something that you're not comfortable with. Most of you are naturally curious people. You pull apart things, you see how they work, you put them back together even better than they were before. Networking is really a curiosity about people. What do they do, how you can learn from it, and what knowledge you have to help them. So don't be afraid to network. And now you can be a capitalist, a social capitalist. So one thing I'd like to mention, I think I've got a few minutes left, is the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. How many people here in their career have had a mentor before? Yep, quite a few. How many people have had a sponsor? Yeah, sort of. Yep. So the difference between mentoring and sponsorship is a, it's a nuanced distinction. A mentor will give you a map and you have to go on the journey. A sponsor will give you the map, 
They'll make sure they introduce you to the boat captain. They'll probably give you some seed funding so you get on the boat. And they'll probably pay for your supplies so that you can drive off the harbour. The sponsor is there backing you. They are behind you 100%. They get your name in front of the people making the promotion decision. If you need to go up the ranks, if you want to go up to the ranks, if you've got the motivation, if you've got your skill sheet filled in, you need a sponsor. So think about not just mentoring but sponsorship. And the flip side of that, if you are in a senior role, think about who's going to be your protege. Think about who you're going to be a sponsor for. Who are you going to invest the time, the energy and your professional credibility in so that you can help them succeed? So the, the sponsorship one is much more investment, both from the protege and the sponsor. So mentoring is fantastic and I don't want to detract in any way from mentoring, but think about sponsorship as well. Who's going to sponsor you into your next role? Something to leave you with. So now you're in the elite wand of sponsorship. Level up. So what have we covered today? We've covered how to know what your character is like. What, what's your generic character for open source? We've covered the different motivators. We've covered learning styles. We've covered mentorship, sponsorship, social capital, and levelling up. So, now that you know how to level up your open source career, what are you going to do next? And on that note, I'll uh, leave you to think about that. Really appreciate your feedback on Joined In, and I also have full academic references if you'd like to learn more about anything in my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cathy. Pleasure. That's great. Um, probably time for one or two quick questions. Uh, well, I have a question then about the um, the uh, the personal side of it. Um, if I feel that I'm a relatively confident speaker and I can be quite nice to people, in a, in a, but I can also be concise and tell somebody online, for instance, if they need to change what they're doing in some mm -hmm. way, and I see somebody who I feel is the opposite, so they're very short to the point and it comes across as rude, mm -hmm. and it may be a language barrier thing, it may not, it may be that they just want to be concise and they don't want to rabble on for a long time, mm -hmm. but I'd like to communicate to that person that perhaps they could to try and educate them, but I, mm -hmm. I struggle to do things like that. I don't want yeah. to impose myself on somebody else in that mm -hmm. manner. Got any thoughts? The, I certainly do. <laughs> Uh, the, the question I'd ask you there, Peter, is what are you hoping to achieve? So are you trying to affect a change in a person's behaviour to stop them from being blunt and rude and therefore uh, perhaps presenting a barrier to people joining that community? Yep. Yeah. In that case, you need to take action. And what I would probably do there is take that person aside face to face, if possible, and say, I know you have the greatest of intent, you're a huge contributor to this community, and I think you would be able to contribute even more if you change your communication style slightly. Appeal not to the, the person, the person isn't in the wrong, the behaviour's in the wrong, so I'd appeal to their sense of contribution and status, you'd have a status, you'd have higher acceptance, if you tweaked your communication style a bit. So I'd appeal to their altruism. <laughs> Pleasure. Paul. Right, good, okay. Um, I've often, I've held the view that um, people who are technically expert um, should have a good career path up through um, into sort of senior technical positions, but a lot of the time I, you see the, the sort of ceiling occur where beyond this point you have to go and be a manager and you have to manage a team, and, mm -hmm. uh, and those people end up spending less time technical, doing technical stuff and more time doing social stuff, which is kind of the opposite of what they've just been training for for the last 10, 15 years. Mm. Um, do, so I've held the view that we should be valuing technical people and should have a, a technical career path. But do you think that's actually present in the workforce now and is it something that managers are looking at or am I just deluded? No, it's, uh, Paul, it's an excellent question. Um, 
I, I don't mean to sit on the fence, but my answer would be I think it's happening in some organisations. So you'll have roles like principal technologist or principal for this technology. Those principals, those leads, will not have people-facing roles. They will not be team leads. They will not be people managers. And they've been chosen for their technical speciality. However, and, and this is a big however, if you're a principal, let's say you're a principal in a 100-person company, you are the lead technologist in that company, CTO type role. Every person, every technologist in that organisation looks up to you for leadership, they look up to you for guidance. And if you behave in a way that's contrary to the culture of that organisation, if you behave in a way interpersonally or conceptually that detracts from the value of that organisation, you're not doing your job. So even if you may not be a strong people manager, if you do not have strong interpersonal skills, if you do not have strong conceptual skills, you shouldn't be in that role. So even though you may be a technical lead, does not get you off the hook for having good people skills or good conceptual skills. So that's, that's how I'd resolve the tension there. All right, thank you very much. Could we have another round of applause for Cathy? My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you very much for your help.